We are getting near the end of our study of 1 Timothy, and uh, I hope you've been excited uh, about this book as, I, as, as we've been, as we've taught it. And uh, uh, we're getting pretty close. In fact, I'm, I'm going to draw on uh, verses that are pretty close to the end, and we'll see how much longer we will stay in this book. But um, I tell you my message, the greatest enemy of godliness. And I feel like the Lord has impressed on my heart the responsibility to speak to you and to myself, first of all, actually, about a very serious deception that exists in the church today. Uh, and I'm talking about Christian churches, evangelical churches, churches that preach regeneration and the new birth, that preach salvation by faith in Jesus Christ and a life of repentance. All of these churches that preach many of the truths in God's Word are plagued by a deception. And I'm not here to point fingers at any church or any denomination. I'm here to point out a finger in myself and see the deception that lies in my own flesh. In my own heart, if I'm not careful, if we don't stay true to God's Word, my heart is so deceptive it can lead me astray. And I feel that that responsibility is impressed on me as I've studied this passage, studied these verses, 1 Timothy 6 verses 17 through 19. And I feel the responsibility to pay attention to it because Paul later on says, Timothy, guard. Guard what I've just said to you in verse 20 after he just tells him what, I, what we're about to look at in verses 17 through 19. So this is something very important and I hope that that seriousness of that deception is, uh, is impressed on your heart as well as, I, as we go through this uh, the next 45 minutes or so. You know that as we've studied the book of 1 Timothy, we've seen some amazing truths. We've seen the mystery of godliness, as it were, unraveled, kind of peeled apart. And I really love how as we've studied it verse by verse and passage by passage, it's like the layers have been, the scales have fallen off my eyes, as it were. Or like we read in another passage, the veil has been lifted. And where it used to be just a lot of words and black on white print, now the veil has been lifted and I've started to see the glory of the mystery of godliness. Christ manifest in the flesh and some wonderful things. And then the body of Christ, the church. And as he's talked about the church, administration in the church, how practical our almighty sovereign God is. Where he's, he says you need to take care of widows and you need, you need to be careful which widows you put on the list. You mean almighty God sitting there with all the things he has to worry about has, has to instruct us to pay attention to that? Yes. And that's the mystery of godliness. That in our, in our pursuit of this godliness, we don't get so super spiritual that we are not of any earthly good. You, you know that, that, that we can become so religious that we're caught up into a monk, ascetic lifestyle where we're, we're living up there and we can't even relate to our wives. And the struggles that they're going through because I'm, I've got to have my prayer time or I've got to have my Bible study time or I'm here with God and you're down there. Wife, why don't you come up here with me? And that's not the spirit of Christ who didn't consider it equality with God something to be grasped but humbled himself and said, is, are you down there, Santosh? Are you down there? Put your name there. He says, I'll come down to your level. That's the mystery of godliness. Christ, seated at the, heavenly, at, this, at the right hand of the Father, manifest in the flesh. A practical Christ. A Jesus who was two years old and four years old and eight and 15 and faced the same temptations as we are, yet never sinned. A Jesus who was 22 and 25 and, and faced the temptation to look on a woman and lust and said, no, I will not. Faced a temptation to get angry and said, no, he would not get angry was tempted to hate his enemies like we just heard and loved his enemies, those Roman soldiers. And I picture Jesus when he was 23 years old and a soldier says, carry my, my, my box for me one mile. And he says, I'll carry it two. Probably knock the socks off that so I'm sure he never heard anything like that. But that's what Jesus came to do is to bring the new covenant. It was like, really? A new way of life where somebody who's oppressing me, I think of ways to bless them. This is the Jesus Christ manifest in the flesh that we've been seeing in 1 Timothy. It's beautiful. And then he says, Timothy, I've, I've told you some wonderful, wonderful things. Now I want to tell you something right at the very end, Timothy, that could cost all of this. You stand to lose all of this because of this deception if you're not careful. I really see it with that seriousness. That he says, having, having opened your eyes to see all of this and you start to taste of it. If you're not careful about this deception... And the thing about a deception is it looks like the real thing. A counterfeit $100 note looks exactly like a, $100, like a real $100 note. There's no, it's not like you know, me just coloring green and drawing whose picture is on it. Uh, Jackson, is it? Somebody, whoever's picture is on a $100 bill. I don't just color with a crayon and say, well, there's a $100 bill. Nobody would fall for that. 
But if you get a counterfeiting machine that duplicates it almost exactly and uses the same kind of paper and looks real, then you might fool somebody with that $100 bill. And the devil is in the business of handing out false gospel, false doctrine, and all kinds of false teaching as counterfeit grace. And it looks just like the real thing. And if we are not sure of what the real thing is, we fall for that deception. So after explaining this mystery of godliness and explaining the church in a practical way, he says this final parting warning. And you may be surprised if you were the Apostle Paul. I present this question to you. If you were the Apostle Paul and you had just described this amazing mystery of godliness, how would you wrap it up? What would you say, okay, this is the final thing, my final word to you, Timothy, watch out for this. What would it be? You'd say, Timothy, you're a young man. Be careful of those women that will try to uh, seduce you. Or Timothy, watch out for, uh, you know, uh, false teachers or wolves that come in sheep clothing. All those things are there. He does warn them about it. But do you know what he finishes with? At the end of 1 Timothy, this letter, he says, Beware of riches. Beware of wealth. Beware of money, Timothy. This is the deception by which you stand to lose all of these wonderful truths. I was struck as I saw that the, 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 the book ends on this page, and here he is at the end of the chapter saying, Timothy, if you're not careful about how you treat wealth, and how you treat the money that God has placed on this earth for you to use, you stand to be led astray and be deceived. Beware of riches. So I'll go out on a limb, and this is not a, just a limb that I like to go out on. It's a limb that I see in God's Word. That's why I have the boldness to say it. That the greatest enemy of godliness is wealth. The greatest enemy of godliness is wealth. Now you may think, well, what's wrong with wealth? It comes from God and everything is good from God. We'll dig into that a little bit. But I want to tell you, dear brothers and sisters, that everything we stand for as a church and all we strive for in the unity of the brotherhood and seeking to be a body and pursuing after godliness and chasing after all of these things, if we are not careful with how we, with how we treat wealth, we stand to be deceived about all of this. We could be running hard after something and be completely blind and not even see that we've been chasing the wrong thing all along. Beware of riches. And why do I say that? Turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 5, 6, and 7, as you know, is the Sermon on the Mount. And in this, in this passage, it's, as far as I can tell in my study of the Gospels, the longest sermon that Jesus ever preached. Most of Jesus' sermons were pretty short, much shorter than mine. So maybe I need to learn something from Jesus in that. But he, he preached very short sermons. But this one time, he did pre preach a long one. And if you were to speak, you know, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, it, it, from what we know, he spoke it all in one sitting. And maybe it would take about a half hour or so. But either way, I think the reason Jesus labored with these things in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, because the teachings here were fundamental to the new covenant that Jesus was establishing. Until then, the Jews and everybody that lived in Israel, God's people, knew only the old covenant, knew only God's old way of dealing with them, which is the Ten Commandments, and thou shalt not. And if you see a woman caught in adultery, you stone her. And if you, um, on a Sabbath day, you don't do any work. And after you... Uh, you don't eat with unwashed hands and etc 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 that's all they knew up to that point and then Jesus came and said I'm bringing to you a new covenant and this is what it's about and one of the things he said in the new covenant is this and that's why I point out that these teachings relate to the new covenant say foundational truth to the new covenant you will hear things in this context in this foundational truth such as I, it used to be okay for you to look at a woman and lust as long as you didn't commit adultery. Now that's not okay. You can't even look. You've already committed adultery if you look. It will used to be okay if you got angry at somebody and spoke something in anger. As long as you didn't kill the guy, you were okay. Now that's not okay. You can't even speak in anger to your wife or your husband or your brother or your sister. That's as good as murder. Those sorts of things. You know about all of that. In that context of establishing the new covenant, he says... It used to be, and let me paraphrase a little bit of what Jesus is trying to say here, and then we'll read what he actually said. It used to be that you could make as much money as you want as long as you gave 10% to God. And it had to be the first 10%. It was the first fruits. So you make a lot of money, and before you do anything to spend it, take 10% out of it and give it to God, and then you can do whatever you want with it. Become a millionaire, a billionaire, it doesn't matter, as long as you calculate your 10% of it exactly and give it to God. And do you know that the majority of Christians are still doing that today? I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with picking a figure on how much you should give to God, but they're still exacting. Okay, Lord, I, I, I saw this word tithe in the, in, your, in the Bible. By the way, you won't find it in the, new covenant, in the New Testament. It's only an Old Testament word, tithe, 10%. So they calculate 10%, and it's a good guide. But 
if, if our mentality is, what's the minimum I want to give God? And God's word says, minimum 10%, I'm still in the old covenant. And I haven't understood God's principle of giving, where he says, give cheerfully. Now the Lord owns 100% of what you are. In this context of presenting the new covenant, he says, verse 19, it used to be Israel that you could lay up treasures for yourself on this earth. Make a lot of money, fight your enemies and take over those lands. And then fight the enemy on this side and take over those lands. And fight the enemy on, the, on that side, take over that land. Fight the Philistines and take their land. It used to be that, but it's a new covenant now. In the new covenant, he says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And what God was trying to show those Jews who were willing to be honest with him, those religious Jews who were faithful according to the law, like the Apostle Paul was before he came and met Christ, all of those Pharisees who met the letter of the law to the uh, to the to the iota of the law the, they crossed their t t's and dotted their eyes exactly according to the law to those people jesus said do you realize that your treasure is still here on this earth and that's not what i want god wants us to live as if our treasure is in heaven to live like our treasure is actually in heaven the lamp of the body is the eye he goes on to see in verse 22 therefore your if your eye is clear your whole body will be clear you see that he's not talking about sexual lust here. A lot of people think that this verse is related to lust or looking with the eye. That, that's in a different passage. Earlier he talked about it in Matthew 5. Here he's talking about how do you look with your eye at the things of this earth? These earthly treasures that could attract your attention. Read it again. Let's go through it again. Where your, verse 21. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If your eye is bad, if the way you look at these things on this earth is to treat it like a treasure, if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. This whole mystery of godliness is darkness for you, for me, if my eye is bad because I covet the mammon of this earth. If your whole eye is bad, if your eye is bad, your whole body is full of darkness. If therefore the light we're talking about light, revelation on the mystery of godliness. If the light that is in you is darkness because of the covetousness of my eye and the fact that I love money and I'm living this life in seeking to, to make as much money as I possibly can and make a little bit more money and pursue after a little bit more money and advance in this system a little bit more and move up the corporate ladder. If that's my eye, all the light that God allows me to receive is darkness. If Therefore, the light that is in you is darkness. How great is the darkness? And then he says, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate what he sees on this earth, this mammon, and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Do you understand the context now where he talks about the eye and he talks about where your treasure is? How he says, these two gods are poles apart. And Jesus makes it very clear. There is God, Jehovah, and the other God is not Satan. It's not anything. It's not adultery. It's not uh, murder. It's not uh, the political system. It's nothing else other than mammon. God and mammon and the things of this earth. You cannot serve God and mammon. So that's why I have that statement up there. That the greatest enemy of godliness. The greatest enemy of godliness. See how Jesus put two gods here. There is godliness, which is the pursuit of the true God, Jesus Christ. Christ manifest in the flesh. And the greatest enemy of that is what Jesus himself said was on the other side of it. Riches, wealth, mammon. Now the Pharisees were a great example of this. We'll turn to Luke chapter 16. I'll show you something there. If you look at the history of the Pharisees, how the Pharisees became who they were, a few hundred years before Jesus came on this earth, the Pharisees were formed, in my understanding, if my understanding is correct, they were formed as a group of people who were seeking after God in holiness. They saw the corrupt nature of Israel. The last prophet that preached before John the Baptist was uh, Malachi, and he, he lived about 400 years before John the Baptist, 400 years before Christ. So picture that 400 years of silence where there's no prophet, no preaching of God's word. They, they just had the synagogues and the dull priests reading the, the, the Torah and all that stuff, but no prophet proclaiming, repent, like all the prophets did. 
So there was this laziness and this backslidden condition that Israel was in as a preparation. When John the Baptist said, hey, you guys that have been backslidden, prepare the way of the Lord. Your Messiah is coming. The Lamb of God that takes the sin, away, sin of the world away. He's coming. And John the Baptist came preparing the way of the Lord. But in that time before John the Baptist came, there was a period of silence. And in the midst of that silence, there was a group of people who said, we really want to go back and become wholehearted uh, followers of God's law. And they formed the Pharisees. The Pharisees became, they weren't, it wasn't a bad term back then because these were people who really wanted to obey God's law, exactly. And they looked at the world and they looked at the sinfulness of the world and how all of Israel was just forsaking the Sabbath and not caring about the tithe. And so they said, well, we better pay attention to the tithe. So now we tithe not only just our money, we tithe our herbs like mint and cumin. And you know, that's what Jesus said, you guys tithe mint and cumin. How did they decide to start tithing mint and cumin? Because they saw the rest of the Israelites, the Jews, just neglecting the tithes altogether. And they said, well, we'll take it exactly. We'll look at everything. I tithe this and I tithe that and I tithe the little, little things. And they focused on the little, 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 little things. Out of a sincere hunger for God, I believe. Like many Christians, like perhaps you and I are or have been. Seeking after God and thinking, Lord, am I, why is it that this thing still has control over me? Why is it I still lose, temper, lose my temper with my wife? Why is it I can't control lust? Why is it I still love money? Should I be doing something different? Should I tithe a little bit more? Should I spend a little bit more time in prayer or Bible study? That's the Pharisee mentality. And he says in Luke chapter 16, these Pharisees, as, they got, as, they, as the years went on and Jesus came, they had become so refined, they had become such experts of the law, that they looked down at others, all these worldly Jews who didn't tithe or tithed a little bit, and they prided themselves on the fact, we tithe even our mint. That's how holy I am. I even tithe my mint, not just my money, my mint. And Saturday, Sabbath, I don't even, I just don't even move. I don't even lift a, a, a paper off the table. That's probably what I figure the Pharisees, the Pharisees saying. That's how self-righteous they were. And he says, he, Jesus gives us a clue into how the Pharisees became the Pharisees here in Luke chapter 16, verse 14. Now the Pharisees were lovers of money. Do you know that that's why the Pharisees became who they were? They loved money. They tithed their mint and their cumin and their tithe, everything else, but inside they loved it. They loved the things of this earth. And they watched all these Jews eating with unwashed hands and and not really tithing at all and enjoying all that they had, never really giving anything to God. And they were jealous. Why? Because they loved money. And it didn't matter that outwardly they were faithful to, to tithe exactly like they were supposed to tithe, but they loved it in their heart. The Pharisees who were lovers of money were listening to all these things that Jesus said and they were scoff scoffing at him. Secretly they loved money. So the greatest enemy, and this I'll tell you, my dear friends, I believe is the surest way to become a legalist. In all our pursuit of godliness, in all our understanding of what we have learned in 1 Timothy chapter 6, if we don't deal with the root of the enemy of God, which is mammon, we will be deceived and we'll become legalists. And we'll take 1 Timothy chapter 6 and use it as a weapon upon others. And we'll, we'll take verses like 1 Timothy chapter 3, that chapter, and use it as, well, these are the requirements of an elder, and these are the requirements for widows, and these are the requirements for deacons, and this and that, and I do not allow women to speak. And this legalistic mentality comes from, irrespective of what the reality of God's truth is, if I haven't dealt with the root of the love of money. Well, you might ask me, what does the love of money really have to do with all of this? It has everything to do with it. Because Jesus said, these are the two gods. If you're serving this God, guess where that pursuit of godliness will take you? Right back towards that God. If that's the God that is secretly in your heart, if you love money, you love the things of this world, all your godliness will take on a form of legalism that will bring others into bondage. That's how the Pharisees became who they were. And that's the danger that, that all of us is presented with now, having seen the mystery of godliness. You see that that's how the devil comes as an angel of light. He says, pursue this mystery of godliness, but pursue after it and still covet the love of my, covet the things of this earth in your heart. Don't deal with that. Just look at the others and how they're dressed immodestly in the world and, and preach about those things and how they, they live in sin and all those things, which are sinful things. But if my love of this world, my love of mammon is not dealt with here, I will become a Pharisee of Pharisees. You know how I know? I've been one for many years. I didn't deal with the love of money, the love of this world. 
And I looked at others who seemed to enjoy the things that they were able to get away with as Christians, and I was jealous in my heart. Have you been there? Have you looked at other Christians and think, how come they get to do that? How come they, they, they can call themselves Christians and they think they're going to heaven, but they get to do that? Have you seen that covetousness in your heart? Or you look at somebody that makes a lot of money and think, well, how can such a person really be a Christian? And I can be poor as a miser and, and poor as a whatever and still covet that and miss out on the kingdom of God. I'd like you to show you two types of richness, two types of riches now. Um, a rich man that Jesus talks about. Both of these are phrases from Scripture. And the other is one, a man who is rich towards God. A rich man and a man who is rich towards God. And it applies to men and women here equally. I'm just using that phrase because it's in the Bible. Somebody who's rich and somebody who's rich towards God. What's the difference? If you look at the grammar of that, a rich man, that word rich qualifies who the man is. You know, when I, when I say that I am uh, an Indian because I was born in India, that qualifies who I am. Uh, uh, or I'm a software engineer, that qualifies what I do in, in my identity. Or I'm a father, that's who I am. I'm a husband, that's who I am. A rich man is, is a man whose identity is in his richness, in his riches, and that's what Jesus was addressing. And the opposite of that is a man who is rich towards God. And you see an activeness in that. And a man who has riches, and we'll see what those riches are, but that richness and those riches are directed towards God. Quite a different thing. Now Jesus said, what, what, is a rich, what is a rich man? I want to show you this definition that, I don't know, perhaps many of you haven't thought about. It. A rich man, Revelation chapter 3. This is somebody who is rich. And rich is not, doesn't necessarily have to do with money. It most often does. But it's a mentality that it is, is irrespective of how much actually sits in your bank account. You could be homeless and a pauper and have zero dollars in your bank account and be rich from God's perspective. Or have a million dollars in your bank account and be poor. It's not, it doesn't have to do with that. It has to do with the attitude of your heart. And this is the attitude of the heart. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. He's talking to the church in Laodicea that he had nothing good to say about Nothing good. All the other churches, even the ones that he rebuked, he had something good. He says, you know, I, I do appreciate this about you. Or I do appreciate this about you. Church in Laodicea, nothing good to say about them. Why? They were rich. He says, you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, and I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. No, this, this is not the world. This is a church that's getting up there on Sunday morning and reading God's word and analyzing the mystery of godliness and studying the letters of Paul if they had them and all these things and they consider their apostle is perhaps the apostle John or something like that because John was writing them this letter. And this supposedly church that's alive, that had a name that's alive but was really dead, what does he say about them? He says, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Why? Because you are rich. You say, I am rich, and have become wealthy. And then he goes on to say, what? What does that mean, that rich and that wealthiness? And have need of nothing. This is a rich man who doesn't really need anything from God. He's got his bank account. He's got things saved up. He's got plans for how this investment is going to mature. And he's got this job lined up. And he's got his, his interests on this earth that he's pursuing. And he's set his eyes on the things of this earth. I have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Do you see the deception here? The reality was that these people in this church in Laodicea were wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I mean, picture somebody here physically like that. Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. Standing here and saying, oh, I'm, you guys, I wish you guys were like me. I'm rich and I have need of nothing and I'm wealthy and I have all this and I have all that. I think the, the, the church in Laodicea, my... I'll take my extension here. Uh, I think they were perhaps the richest church among the seven churches in, in, uh, in, talked about in the book of Revelation. Because they said, I, because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, but you don't know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus said in Mark 10, 23, there's only one person about whom Jesus said, it's hard for such a person to enter the kingdom of God. He didn't say that about the prostitutes. And he didn't say that about the drunkards. Yes, it says they will be judged. You read the book of Revelation. They will be judged. They will be judged. But there was one and only one category of people that Jesus said, it is hard for them to enter the kingdom of God. It's a rich man, a rich woman. 
somebody who has need of nothing, somebody who looks at their family perhaps and thinks how, how wonderful this is and, how, and looks at their business and how it's doing so well and it's, it's progressing. And look at where they are in the corporate structure and think, wow, in a few years I could make manager and director, vice president, I'm moving up this corporate ladder. And they think I have need of nothing. Yeah, Lord, I pray. Uh, our Father and how art in heaven, I give my tithe to the church every Sunday. I'm there, I'm a regular member, and I'm there on Wednesdays as well. But my eye is on this earth. Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Such a man, it's hard. Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. You know that picture. The camel trying to go through the eye of a needle, and the response of the disciples was like, wow. If it's hard for the rich, where's, where do we stand a chance? Did you see that? I don't have time to show it to you. But essentially, Jesus said, the rich, it's going to be hard for them. And the disciples thought, wow, those are the guys that have a better chance because they are well-respected in the world. They have all the money. They stand a better chance of entering into God's kingdom than me. And Peter said, or one of the disciples said, Lord, if, if it's hard for them, what about us? We don't even stand a chance. And Jesus said, no, you have it backwards. Many who are first will be last. And many who are last will be first. That which you see is first on this earth. The one whose business is most prospering will probably be last. The one who's last on this earth and you think, well, that's despised. Nobody looks at him and thinks, well, that's a successful man or there's a successful woman. They will probably be first in the kingdom of God. That's the reversal of God's, uh, of the order that you see on this earth. And so when you look at the things of this earth and you see people who are doing well and you set as your heroes or your idols, the person who made a million or made a billion or made this, if you make that person your idol and you follow after that person, very likely you will follow them into deception. Whether they're Christian or not, whether they attend church or not, whether they read the Bible or not, it has nothing to do with that. Because those people whom you said as your forerunners are chasing after this world, the God of this world. And they will lead you, they will lead us, my dear brothers and sisters, if we set our eyes on them into the pit. That's the exact opposite of the mystery of godliness that we have seen. Now a man who's rich towards God on the other hand, you'll read here in 1 Timothy 6. Let's go back to here. We didn't actually read these verses. So let me read them now. Matthew, 1 Timothy 6, verses 17 through 19. Instruct those who are rich in this present world. Somebody who's got a lot of money, made a lot of money and proud of it. has got a lot of money, a lot to show for. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. He says, Timothy, tell them, you could have those riches now and you might think I have a lot of money now. It could go in a moment. The uncertainty of riches. But fix your hope on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. If you fix your hope on God, He will take care of every single one of your needs. He will ensure that you have enough food, clothing and shelter and some to take care of your family. Fix your hope on God. That's the difference between the two types of people living on this world. It's not Christians and non-Christians. It's not people who claim to have said a prayer in the name of Jesus and those who have not. That, that's not how God looks at it. I believe the sheep and the goats that Jesus talked about in Matthew 25 are those who have fixed their hope on God, sheep, and those who have fixed their hope on uncertain riches, goats. That's the difference. And it's, you read the stern warning there in Matthew 25. The angel will come and say, I know you've been sitting in that church and you heard a lot of good teaching and all that, but I see that you fixed your hope on uncertain riches. Stand over here. And then there's somebody else who nobody thought much of and says, I know nobody thought much of you and you didn't even have a fellowship in your neighborhood, but you fixed your hope on the certain God. Stand over here, sheep. And he will divide the sheep and the goats. It's a very, very stern thing that happens. And I really believe this with all of my heart, brothers and sisters, that the distinction is not going to be whether we were a new covenant church or attended this church or listened to that teaching or whatever. Even if we call ourselves Christians, I believe it with all of my heart because I've seen the deception in my own heart. The distinction is going to be who did I fix my hope on or what? Was it God who was unchanging and certain or was it these uncertain riches on this earth? Was my hope based on the fact that I have a secure job or for us coming from India, I got my green card finally. Some of you guys might relate to that. Or whatever it might be. If you have a level of security that's based on this earth, I am in danger. If that's my level of security, I'm in danger of being a goat. Now God has given us these things He says here to enjoy who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy, but fix your hope on Him. And He will determine, determine the circle that He draws around you. How much money is in your bank account? How much salary you earn per year? And it has nothing to do with the person sitting next to you in the same pew, in the same church. 
And you can't look at your brother and think, well, Lord, how come you allowed him to earn so much money and only, me only so much? Fix your hope on God who supplies everything richly and you will experience the mystery of godliness. Instruct them to do, so what should you do? Instruct them to do good, he says in verse 18. To be rich in good works. You see the contrast that he says? Here is the world that's pursuing the riches of this world. And there's the people who have fixed their hope in God and thinking and realizing that true riches comes from seeing how much I can do to bless somebody else. Can I take time off from work and get off early and clock out early because somebody needs help? Somebody, I want to meet with somebody to encourage him and pray with him. Are you willing to do that? You have fixed your hope on God, knowing that he will supply all your needs. And you know that some of you are doing that. I see that. I see that you are fixing your hope on, on the living God who will never let you down. Even if it means financial sacrifice, even if it means taking a pay cut, even if it means some other thing that you cannot do because it requires doing it with a bad conscience, that business deal, you're not willing to do it because it'll dishonor God. God sees it, sees that you have fixed your hope on Him, not on these uncertain riches. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasures of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. So this, the, a man who is rich towards God looks at what good deeds he can do to people around him and realizes that in those good deeds, and this, you know, you realize that this opportunity is available equally to all of us irrespective of our qualification. You don't even have to finish first grade to qualify for the riches of heaven. Now for the riches of the earth, you get a PhD like Gabe, maybe you set yourself or you get a degree like I have or whatever, you finish certain schools, you set yourself up. Not that that's a bad thing, I, I preach, I'm glad I went to college. I have work that gave me flexibility. But in this earth, they, it's, it's based on how much you learned and how far did you go or did you spend enough time? Do you have any, enough experience in that field? In the kingdom of God, every one of us is on the same level playing field. You might not have had the opportunities as the person sitting next to you. You might feel young in the faith that you're a young believer. But that same opportunity, my dear, immature young brother, new in the faith, is available to you. Young sister, new in the faith, is available to you because you fix your hope on God and say, Lord, I build riches in heaven. Are you interested in depositing into your heavenly bank account? If that's your interest, listen on. I got good news for you. 